May I just challenge you, if you've let your prayer, uh, your daily prayer time uh, go, would you start tomorrow morning? So if you've, just think for a moment, uh, how is your daily prayer time and your Bible study? So will you start tomorrow morning? You know, just make a start tomorrow morning. Decide at this moment, now what time can you get up? Can you get up at five or six or seven, whatever time? And then just quietly decide to get up and do it. You know, okay? Just even if it's five minutes, begin. Okay, shall we pray? Dear Father, we thank you that you alone can draw us to yourself. And so I trust you to do that with all of us, especially with me, these, these evening services. Lord, I, I would pray that you would draw us all into your own heart and you teach us from your precious word. And dear Holy Spirit, will you work in our consciences so that we are not great students on Sunday evening and bad obeyers during the week. But will you work in us so that we actually obey through the week what we hear from you on Sunday. We ask this for Jesus' growth in our lives. Amen. <coughs> Loved ones, I would like to start again the series on the spiritual life and begin tonight and go on through the next three years on the spiritual life. I have a verse of Scripture that you might look at to describe what the spiritual life is. It's Romans 8 and verse 13. Romans 8 and verse 13. It's page 983 in the Revised Standard Version. Romans 8 and verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. I think a lot of us here regard ourselves as Christians, but we're virtually dead. I think there are a lot of ideological believers, people who believe that Jesus died for them, and they themselves made a surrender to him at some meeting or other. But they did not walk according to the Spirit, or they did not live according to the Spirit, and they are as good as dead. And depending on where you stand in eternal security, if you stand with me, uh, you say that they're really alive, but they look like dead people. Or if you stand on the other side and you believe there isn't eternal security, then you say they have died spiritually. But however it is, they have no living relationship with God. Now, that's one of the reasons I think we should deal in detail with the spiritual life and how to walk after the Spirit. Because I think a lot of you loved ones have deadness in your lives, not because you were never born of the Spirit, but because you don't walk after the Spirit. And you stop walking after the Spirit very soon after you receive Jesus. So the spiritual life is a life that is lived by the rule and the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. A moment-by-moment -moment direction and rule. And if you're not living that way, you're probably dead as far as your relationship with God is concerned. Now, loved ones, there's another important verse that would tell you what we're about here on Sunday evening and why I'm going to try to speak on the spiritual life yet again in another series. That is Genesis 2 and verse 9. Genesis 2 and verse 9. It's page 2. You should be able to manage that. Genesis 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are two trees that you can eat from in order to try to have a relationship with God. 
You can eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or you can eat from the tree of life. Let me share with you, anybody here who's thinking, what again? Do you know how often I've preached this series? This is my fifth time, over 11 years. Yeah. So I've talked about these things for four times already, taking three years each time to cover them. Now, why do I do it again? Because I know that what I need is not knowledge. I understand them fairly well in my head, but I need life from the Holy Spirit. And what you need in these Sunday evenings is not a better knowledge of these things, but loved ones, you need to pray that the Holy Spirit will prepare you and that he will speak to me and give me new light so that you will receive life here. That's what you need to walk after the Spirit. So some of you loved ones, I understand you, I really do. You say, oh, Sunday evening again, spirit, soul, body. No, I understand it all. But do you see, you're proving that you live by knowledge and that you think because you understand it, you're in it. Loved ones, the greatest truth I saw about dear old saints was they could listen to a simple evangelistic sermon for sinners, and they could come out filled with life from Jesus after it. And it was then that I began to realize that loved ones who are really alive in Jesus are seeking for life. They're not seeking for knowledge. And the people who go out of a service and say, oh, it's the same thing as I heard before, all they're trying to do is live off increasing knowledge. One of the reasons I decided to do this again this year was because I saw so many of us running around trying to get more knowledge. And it is really interesting, loved ones, if you stand back from even a group like yourselves, it's very interesting to see us all swarm like little bees to the next honeypot that comes into Wall Chamberlain Airport. It really is. A, a, a great Christian speaker or leader comes into the Twin Cities, and we're off like a little swarm of bees. And really, when you think of it, it must have something to do with the knowledge business. Because if it's the life business, we know we can receive the same life from the same Jesus who is in that person in our own bedroom. But I see so many of us swarming after more and more knowledge. And I see us buying yet another book. I don't know if you've noticed the kinds of books that are coming out now and that are preying upon all of us. They are how-to books. They are. I, I won't name the titles, but they are all how-to books, even if how isn't in the title. The Christian world is filled with books on technique and method, really betting on the thirst for knowledge that so many of us so-called children of God have. And loved ones, we don't need more knowledge of good and evil. We don't need more ways of being saved apart from God's life. We need God's life. So I would point out to you that the spiritual life is a quality of life or a level of life. It is not a technique or a method of keeping close to God. And so what we're reading from on these Sunday evenings is not the tree of knowledge. If it is, you're just going to be bored to tears and you'd better stop coming. But it's the tree of life. And I know in my own life over these past 11 years, every time I have talked about these things, Jesus has grown and grown in my own spirit. And just talking about these holy things of God enables the Holy Spirit to make them more real to you. So I ask you to come Sunday evenings yearning and hungry for food and for life. So there are two kinds of people, really, that should not be here on Sunday evenings. And you'll find the basis for those two groups in 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 13 through 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and verses 13 through 14. It 
It's page 992. 1 Corinthians 2 and 13 and 14. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who possess the Spirit. The unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, there are two groups that should not be here on Sunday evening. The first is, and I apologize to you, loved ones, if you aren't a Christian, but the first is non-Christians because really the truths we're sharing are for those who are spiritually alive. And they won't mean anything to loved ones who haven't committed their lives to Jesus and received his spirit into them and allowed his spirit to rule their lives. They won't understand them, and the stuff will come over as legalism, and they'll just go from bad to worse. So, loved ones, I would encourage you not to bring non-Christian friends on Sunday evening. You should bring them on the Sunday mornings. Uh, I feel there's a dearth, even in these twin cities, of deep teaching on the spiritual life. And that's what we're going to involve ourselves in, in these services. So non-Christians should not be present. The other kind of person that shouldn't be, Christian, uh, shouldn't be present is verse 14. The unspiritual man does not receive the gifts of the Spirit of God. Uh, you, some of you, know what that Greek word is. It is, in fact, uh, uh, that sukakos, and it looks like that, and it is P-S-Y-K-I-K-O-S. And, of course, it is the soulish person. And that's the person who is looking for more knowledge. So, loved ones, you know, if, if you're just collecting deeper knowledge and you somehow think that you'll grow in Jesus the more you understand things, then you shouldn't come because you won't get that kind of truth here. It'll be life. It'll be spiritual life to you. And you need to come each Sunday evening saying, not what is this guy going to tell me that I don't know? What new thing is he going to tell me? What new illustration is he going to use? You need to come saying, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you for food and for water of life. And I'm looking forward to receiving it from you. And loved ones, if you come that way and pray for me, the Holy Spirit will feed us all and we'll grow together in Jesus. But will you really accept that? Because don't you see that it is beyond any man? What are we? Poor little creatures, poor little finite men and women. It is beyond any man to give you something deeper than you have. No man can do that, least of all this creature here. But Jesus can give us all food and water of life on these Sunday evenings. So I ask you to seriously think of all of that as, as we begin the study of the spiritual life. Maybe you would notice that one of the bases of our studies will again and again be Scripture. And so I would just point out to you God's plan for our own personal lives and our own personalities. And it's one that most of you know very, very well. It's in a very famous verse, which uh, I can say in my sleep, and many of you can. It's 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And I would really ask those of you who know some of the facts to pray for the loved ones who don't know these facts and realize that there are some of us here this evening that actually have never seen this and don't yet know it and pray that it will come home as new and, and fresh and real to them. Here's the outline of the personality that God has given us in his word. It's page 1031, loved ones, 1031. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God says, we live on three levels. We have a spirit and a soul 
and a body. Now, that is called trichotomy. For those of you who have done a little study in psychology or even philosophy, that is called trichotomy because it's three. The normal distinction in secular psychology that's made is dichotomy, two. The visible, the body here, and the invisible, the mind or the spirit at times, they would say, but the mental part of us. Now, God says that there is a threefold life within us. I don't know, loved ones, that it's a big deal to argue over spirit, soul, and body, or spirit and body. I don't know, in other words, that it's important to argue two against three. But it is important to see that you can live on three levels of life, and that your life can be dictated by either the outside or the inside. And I think in some ways, it is very important to make the biblical distinction. The biblical distinction, you see, is that outside there is the body, and then inside that there is the soul which would be kind of the psychological part of us. And inside that, again, is the spirit. And one of the values of looking at our personalities as God does, that I have seen, is that many loved ones have trouble with self-image. They have trouble with a good self-concept. And so often, if they don't make a threefold distinction, if they only make a distinction that is twofold and they think of the body and then they think of inside the soul, they often try to correct that self-image or that bad self-concept by juggling their thoughts around or by working on their feelings. And often the poor self-image is a result of something being wrong inside there in the spirit. It's a result of a wrong relationship between them and God. But they go to a, a psychiatrist, or they go to a friend or a counselor, and they try to work up good self-image and good thoughts. And you'll find them so often talking about themselves in this, these terms, they'll say, I don't love myself enough. I don't love myself enough. And they get into all kinds of contortions trying to love themselves without loving themselves, trying to kind of think of themselves right and yet trying not to think of themselves too much. And it is really an impossible task because the problem of a wrong self-image or self-concept is not in the soul. It is, in fact, in the spirit. But if you don't make that distinction, you'll have real trouble continually with that. So I think if you don't make a distinction between spirit, soul, and body, you'll often come up against personal difficulties in your own life that you cannot solve, that you'll deal with on the wrong level. I think many of us have seen difficulties in loved ones who are mentally disturbed. And some of us are demon-casting mad. We cast out demons at the first glint of insanity. And we're all for casting out a demon, casting out a demon. Sometimes loved ones who are emotionally disturbed or mentally confused have problems in the soul. They have a disordered soul. They have a soul that has been so used to being dominated by the body that it is working the wrong way in all kinds of areas. And what they need is someone carefully and lovingly to deal with each one of those areas. And as the soul comes into order, they themselves begin to come into sanity and balance. There are other loved ones who are willfully disobeying God, and they are willfully entertaining a demon who brings error into their lives or brings some overwhelming lust into their lives. And their problem is one that has to be dealt with by casting out the demon. But if you don't make a distinction between spirit and soul, 
often you can try to apply the same apparent solution to both cases, and that's why many of us have seen a failure in those situations. Think another problem that you get into if you don't make a threefold distinction, but only make a distinction between the body and the mind or the emotions, you have real problems with the difference between faith and feeling. Because you say, oh yes, I live by faith and not by feeling, but yet you keep on thinking to yourself, yes, but isn't faith feeling God's presence? And isn't faith feeling the warm glow of God's love in my heart? Or feeling His joy as I pray to Him? And if you don't make a distinction between what the Spirit can perceive and what the soul can perceive, and you don't know the difference then, you will never be able to make a distinction between faith and feeling. So there are many reasons why it is important to accept God's outline of biblical psychology. Now, brothers and sisters, honestly, I would not fight to the death on spirit, soul, and body. That's the terms. What I would fight to the death on is that whatever terms you use, you do live on three levels. And there are three levels of life that all of us experience. And it is important to preserve the reality of those if we're going to make a distinction between spiritual healing and psychological healing, both of which I think are needed under God's guidance. So this is the outline God gives of the personality. He says, may the spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. And I'd point out to you that that is real prayer that God expects our spirits, souls, and bodies to be healthy and to be blameless and to be good and in good shape. And that only if all of them are in good shape can he really be fully glorified. And it is his will through Jesus to bring all of them into complete order and into complete health. So that's the first point that we need to be clear on, that God regards us as spirit and soul and body. Now, Maybe it is good for you to see that you yourself cannot make a distinction there. You can't. Brothers and sisters, I think you will become absolute introspective nuts if you try to divide the soul from the spirit. That's where I think... At times after evening service, you ask me questions that cannot be answered. You know. And they're all around the level of trying to make a distinction. Am I doing this in my spirit? Am I doing this in my soul? And brothers and sisters, it will get you absolutely nowhere. You cannot make the distinction yourself between spirit and soul. Uh, the dear fellow whom I think is just a dear older brother to us, just puts it very, very strongly, you know, in, in his introduction to this whole thing. And he talks about the whole difficulty that comes about when you begin to look inward. It is of the utmost importance that we never try to analyze ourselves. Upon reading such a treatise as this, we may quite unconsciously become overactive in self-analysis. In observing the condition of our inward life, we tend to overanalyze our thoughts and feelings and the movements of the inner man. This may result in much apparent progress, yet actually it renders treatment of the self-life that much more difficult. If we persistently turn within ourselves, we shall lose our peace completely, for we shall soon discover the discrepancy which exists between our expectation and our actual condition. We expect to be filled with holiness, but we are found wanting in holiness. This makes us uncomfortable. God never asks us to be so introspective. To do so constitutes one of the main reasons for spiritual stagnation. Our rest lies in looking to the Lord, not to ourselves. In the degree that we look off unto Him, to that degree are we delivered from self. We rest on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, not on our own shifting experience. True spiritual life depends not on probing our feelings and thoughts from dawn to dusk, but on looking off to the Savior. Now, that's what faith is. It's looking off to Jesus. And so, 
most of the things that we share on Sunday evenings are not to be taken by your mind and applied and hammered into your heart. They're to be given to the Holy Spirit, who alone can apply them, because He alone can make that division, loved ones. Because it is important to make it. You'll see other reasons why it's important to make it. It's important for the spirit gradually to be divided from the soul and then for them to be rejoined in the right relationship because the problem, as you'll see in later e Sunday evenings, is that they are wrongly related. But there's only one can do that, and that one is in, mentioned in Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. And no doubt, of course, many of the loved ones who are in psych wards are, are there because really the body of Jesus has not realized this truth and has not practiced this truth. And so they themselves are utterly in chaos because of the disorder of the relationship of their soul to their spirit. It's verse 12 of Hebrews 4. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. Now, do you see that? Piercing to the division of soul and spirit. And uh, that helps any of us, you know, who, who might be tempted to say, oh, I thought every time the Bible mentioned spirit, it meant soul, and every time it mentioned soul, it meant spirit, spirit and soul are the same. No, do you see there's a clear distinction there? Piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the Word of God alone, who is really the sword of the Spirit, can give you revelation in certain moments when you may not be expecting it, can give you a revelation of times when your soul is out of order with your spirit. And even then, it's been my experience that once I re received it, it was very important for me not to try to apply it by my mental memory, but to thank the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, will you keep me clear of this in the future? Now you've revealed it to me, will you keep me clear of it? And then he, of course, knew fine well that it was not just a matter of my perception, but that my soul had become over strong in certain areas, and he had to break that strength in me. And so that's the way it operates, loved ones. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, pierces you, reveals the intentions and the desires of your heart to you so that you see, ah, oh, what soulishness, how much I was involved with just my mind and my emotions or with myself. And the Holy Spirit reveals that to you. And then in subsequent days and weeks and months, He breaks that in you. We love to think it's just a matter of us perceiving and we can do it. It's not. Usually the soul has grown overly in some area and needs to be broken of some strength. But that's the way it works, loved ones. It doesn't work through us doing it ourselves. Now, may I just point to you the way God created us at the beginning? And you find it there in Genesis 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Maybe I could just show you some of the important words in that verse that we've read so often. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. And actually, uh, the, uh, word, the word for uh, dust is afar and looks like that, and the word for uh, ground is adama, and uh, looks like that and becomes Adam, though it, it would be the other way around. Hebrew is backwards, so it's that way. But that's God made us of the ground, and that's the body part of us. And he took dust and made our bodies. And then he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of lives, because actually the uh, the Greek, uh, or the Hebrew rather, is chayim, 
And uh, this is I am, loved ones. This ending is I am. And it always means the plural. And so it's actually not life in the singular. It's the breath of lives. And the word for breath in that verse is the word ruach. Like that. R, it would be forwards, R-U-A-H. Ruach. And that is the same word for spirit. So you see what the Father did? He took our bodies and he breathed into them the spirit. And then man became a living being. And the old uh, King James is right there rather than the, the, uh, um, uh, the RSV. Because the word is nephesh, N-E-P-H-E-S-H. And that means soul. And so God breathed. He took dust of the ground and made man's body. He breathed into it his ruach, his spirit, and man became a living soul. And that's why often the Bible uses soul in two ways. Often it refers to man as a soul. Or you remember in Revelation, for instance, they talk about the souls of the dead. Because Soul is what makes man unique. Uh, animals have bodies. Angels have spirits. But man is unique in that he has a soul. And the soul is the unique part of man. And it is actually the part that gives him his individuality or gives woman her personality. And it's the part where the two mix. It's like put, taking water and putting powder into it, and the result is instant coffee. And so the two are blended perfectly together. And that was the way it was at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. All three were blended perfectly. And it is interesting, brothers and sisters, but as you read some of the books by Andrew Murray and some of the books by Law and some of the books like that one, the uh, God's Life and the Soul of Man, you'll find that they attach all our problems to a disorder in the relationship of these three things inside us. And salvation is those three things coming into the right order. So in the beginning, they were perfectly blended. Uh, God put his spirit into man, and man became a living soul, and then man was capable of union with God. It is good for us to see, too, that God's spirit is separate from our spirit. You see that? When God gave us a spirit, that spirit remained it didn't always remain in contact with God or related to God. And therefore, it was not always alive to God. But that spirit remains. And so all of us have spirits. And Gene Dixon has a spirit. And Hitler had a spirit. And the dangerous thing, for instance, about uh, the loved ones in the Mormon church is they have spirits. And it is the spirits, it is the spirit in them that is dangerous. Their, their doctrine is dangerous, but the most dangerous thing is the demon of error that operates in them. That's why when we talk about people who are in willful disobedience and in willful error in the sects, we say, keep clear of them. We say, don't even talk with them. Not because you might be uh, overcome by their arguments, but because they have entertained a evil spirit of error within them. And their spirit is possessed by that. And you can actually come away with some of that attached to your spirit if you are not resisting and standing in Jesus against it. So all of us have spirits, but our spirits are separate from God's spirit. It might be good to look at a verse that teaches that plainly. It's Romans 8 and verse 16. And it's one of the assurance verses, you remember. Romans 8 and verse 16. And you get the distinction there. Romans 8 and 16. It is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And you see, the capital S at Spirit means that in the Greek uh, there is... Uh, can someone tell me as new ma masculine, feminine, and neuter? 
All you Greek scholars. Good. So it is he, rather he's uh, uh, voting feminine there. But uh, it's pneuma, loved ones, if it is feminine, it is in fact the. That is the word for the. That's the article. And so where it says spirit with a capital S in Romans 8 and 16, it's the spirit with the article. But then where it says with our spirit, there is no article. There is just the word for us, uh, which is our, our, which is hemon. So the first spirit is always the Holy Spirit of God. Whenever the spirit has the article in Greek, it means God's spirit. Whenever it hasn't, it's our spirit. So it's good for you to see that there is the Holy Spirit of God who is unique. And then all of us have spirits. And when we're uh, not children of God, our spirits are dead to him. And of course, the real danger is that they can be alive to all kinds of other things. That's why there is such uh, a plethora of uh, spiritism and spiritualism in our day. You see that? Because the materialism has become so oppressive that our spirits feel more and more squashed to death and crushed. And so there is a great hunger in even the spirits of absolute pagans here in our Western world. There is a great hunger. There is, in fact, even in them, a rejection and a reaction against materialism, materialism. They find it doesn't matter how much they own, they still have an emptiness inside, and their spirits demand some kind of life. And so, of course, they go to the kind of life that Satan and his angels produce in spiritualism and seances. So, there is a great deal of bad and evil spiritual life in our world, as well as the spiritual life that comes from uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's quite important for us to see that. Now, the, maybe it would be good, loved ones, just to go right to the, the final comments and, and finish there. One of the beautiful analogies uh, to our personality that the Bible gives is found in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. It's page 994, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? In other words, the body is really just an enclosure for the Spirit within. And it is interesting just to look at the whole idea of your personality as the temple of God, because it does provide some light on the different parts of our personality. The temple in the Old Testament had actually a holy of holies, and it had an outer court. And then it had, thirdly, a place that was designated the holy place. And the outer court was a public place where you could see plainly because it was daylight. It was really like your body. And you have no trouble seeing what the hand is doing or what the fingers are doing. You have no trouble seeing what the feet are doing. You can see what your body's doing. It's a plain and open uh, thing that you can see with your own eyes and observe, or you can hear, or you can taste. The holy place was within, and yet there was the light of the candles. And there were some other things in that holy place so that you could see it. And the priests were allowed to go in and out of there. They, you couldn't see quite so plainly because it wasn't daylight, but you could still see. And it is interesting that your soul is a place that you can look into and see. 
You can look into your soul where you'll, we'll see next Sunday where the mind is and you can perceive thoughts. What am I thinking? Thinking how bright that light is. That, all right, I can think. I can think what I'm thinking. I can reflect on it. You can look into your feelings and see what you're feeling. So the holy place is a place that you can see, not quite so clearly as seeing your body, but you can still see it. The holy of holies was absolutely dark because it was the place where God dwelt. And there was no light there because he provided all the light that was needed. And everything that went on in there went on by faith. The people simply believed that God was there. They simply believed that God was there in the Holy of Holies. And everything actually that went on out here in the holy place and in the outer court was directed by what went on in the Holy of Holies. And yet what went on there, nobody actually knew. They believed God to be working there and operating. And all oh, loved ones, if, if you would grasp that with all of your being, you would stop this business of trying to look in to see how you're doing with God. Because the answer is, you cannot. The priest alone went in here once a year. No one else went in. And only the priest, the Holy Spirit, the other self of our great high priest, only the Holy Spirit can go into your Holy of Holies. And that's why you're absolutely dependent on what he says to you when he comes out. You are. That's why it's so important when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, do this, you should do it. Because he knows fine well that from what he's seen in here in your relationship with God, if you do this thing that he tells you, then God will be able to fill a new place in your life. But brothers and sisters, all you can do is obey blindly the directions of the Holy Spirit. You can always check those directions against his word, which he has written. You can always check that they're consistent with that. You can always confirm it with other brothers and sisters who also have contact with the Holy Spirit, but you yourself cannot see in there. And if you are going to have God working in your life, it has to be by faith. You have to exercise faith that God has done what he said he'd do. He stood at the door and knocked. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. You have to accept by faith that he has come in and that he's working there. And that his high priest, the Holy Spirit, will go in and out of there, will check out how the works are, and then he'll come out and tell you what you need to do. Now, you see the chaos that you and I get into when we treat the words of the Holy Spirit lightly. That's where we get into problems. So, you know, if you say, oh, I have trouble with the presence of God in my life, do you see the only thing you can do about it is do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do in your outward life. And then if you do that, you can trust and believe absolutely that God is completely at home inside your spirit. And you can trust him to send out from your spirit whatever kind of love or joy or peace that you need. But, oh, if you would just remember the, the picture of the temple, and if you would just remember that no one could see what went on there, only God's spirit could, and God himself. And you cannot see what is in your spirit. So really, when, when you get worried about God's presence in your life because you can't feel him, it's silly. I mean, it's so ridiculous that it's not even worth saying. It's so ridiculous that nobody can make any sense of it. If you get worried because you can't feel God in your life, I feel you're asking me, what is a square circle? Because I think to myself, but you can't feel God in your life anyway. Anybody knows that. You can feel God in your soul. You can feel if he's sending up some happy feelings or if he isn't. But often he doesn't send up happy feelings. Often he knows it's time for you to walk a bit by faith this time. 
So he doesn't send up happy feelings. Sometimes he does grant you consolation of great joy and great peace. But very often, and particularly as you move on deeper with him in your life together, he sends up no happy feelings. He develops more and more your absolute faith. So that, for instance, if a time should ever come, and perhaps it never will, but if a time should ever come that you would find yourself in the position that some people find themselves in in Soviet prison camps today, where you would be tortured beyond the point of physical endurance, your spirit would remain strong in God. You might not even know it was strong, but it would be strong because the Holy Spirit would be able to keep it strong through the years of obedience that you had exercised. So, loved ones, it's that kind of situation that you actually are going to come into if you're going to be used by God. Not necessarily torture, not necessarily a prison camp, but you're going to come into situations where your spirit has to have absolute rock-like stability, untouched by what is happening to your body, untouched by what is happening to your soul. And the only way that that can be wrought in you is through the work of the Holy Spirit. And He can only work if every time He comes out through that door and says to you, one a glass of Coke is enough. Or he says to you, that's enough looking. That's enough. Just stop. Or he says to you, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., pray. Or he says to you, you give this money to this person. Or he says to you, you fill in your income tax completely this time. Whatever the Holy Spirit says to you, you have to do it exactly. I, you know, it's not even in my hands. I can't even mellow it for you. I can't even make it easier for you. I know that God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey, and the Holy Spirit alone can make God real in your spirit and keep your spirit alive if you obey Him every time He comes out and gives you directions and commands. So, brothers and sisters, that's the kind of outline of our personality that God gives us in the Bible, and that's the kind of plan he has for the relationships between them. And next Sunday, I'd like to deal in detail with the difference between our spirits and our souls, and the different functions of our spirits and the different functions of our souls. And I would ask you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what is there in this for me tonight? Not Holy Spirit, what was Pastor trying to say, but Holy Spirit, what is there in this for me tonight? And I, I'm sure, you know, as I give some of those illustrations, the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something. Commit yourself this moment to obedience, loved ones, and you'll have no trouble with what's going on in there, because that is not your business. That is not your business. Your business is obeying the high priest who will keep things right in your spirit because your spirit you cannot touch. He alone can touch, and he'll touch it on one condition, that you obey him. So, it really, it's a beautifully simple life. It really is. It never gets much deeper than trust and obey, for there's no other way. Really. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that however deep we may go into our understanding of your truths, they all come down to a very simple gospel trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And Lord, thank you that we don't need to understand the world of theology in order to do that. We know your voice, Holy Spirit. We've heard your voice in our consciences a thousand times, and we know you've spoken to us about some things even now. And we know that if we obey you on those you will take care of that part of us that we cannot touch, our spirits, the part of us that contacts our God. Holy Spirit, we see that our souls can deal with ourselves and our bodies can deal with the world, but only our spirits perceive God. And you alone can make those spirits alive so that they can be rightly related to our Father. So we would commit ourselves to obeying you so that you may keep us rightly related to God in Jesus, our Savior. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore.